water. It's life's most basic need. It's our most precious resource. But at the same time, water is the fastest growing challenge worldwide. Water affects everything. Health, industry, education, our well-being. It changes our standard of living. In fact, water changes everything. Our Poled Water Group companies are dedicated to developing solutions that improve the quality of water and enable a more efficient use of water. We engineer, assemble and commission. We are committed to offering intelligent and user-friendly products that treat the water in your homes, your businesses, your factories, your schools, your hospitals. By applying the most advanced technologies, we take up the biggest challenge of our time. Water. Join us on our mission. Make water count. Good morning. Hi, welcome everybody. So, we had some technical issues a few days ago, <laughs> so we would like to ask you just to write a small message into the chat if you can hear us already. Okay, good. All right, Everyone brilliant. Already? <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. So, then we will start right into the agenda. We will shortly introduce ourselves in the beginning and then we will talk a bit about pump design and energy efficiency of the reverse osmosis systems. Then we will do a small calculation of the energy consumption and also have a small perspective what is happening afterwards. All right, so we will start with your hosts and we'll show you a bit about working with EduDip, but I think the most participants have already seen EduDip already, and then we will talk about the objectives from this webinar today. So, I myself, I'm René Scholz, and I'm responsible for the Hercule Academy. Meanwhile, I have 10 years experience in water treatment, and for the last five years, I've been a technical trainer, and I'm also certified by TÜV, which is the notified body in Germany. Yes, yeah, so my name is Birgit Fabricius. Um, I'm responsible for product management in HERCO and I've worked for 13 years in uh, wastewater treatment first and then the water treatment sector. In the HERCO Academy we are doing about 40, tra 40 trainings every year but since we are having this uh, situation with COVID-19 we are forced or we were forced to start with webinars and we are really happy about this new way to get in contact with our clients. And we already had some successful ones with the new blow, uh, blowdown controller, cultural data, and also a nano filtration event. Yeah, so with EduDip, you have the possibility to give us hand sites if you want to let us know something, if you want us to repeat something. Overall, the communication works via the chat, as you have already seen. Your microphones and cameras are deactivated just to don't have any interferences. And the webinar will also be recorded and provided afterwards to you. So send questions via the chat if you want to, and we will answer them after each chapter. And if you have really specific questions, we will answer them via mail afterwards. So the Objectives in general are yeah, to get to know the digital learning process and also in the technical part, we want to talk about basic understanding of pumps, energy demand of pumps, also the energy efficiency of reverse osmosis, 
and we are looking at different scenarios for the reverse osmosis and also do a calculation of the return on investment with and without the frequency inverter pumps. So for the beginning, we would like to start with a survey and we would like to ask you which pump do you use most commonly? So we, you can either choose if you're seeing mostly static pumps or on the other hand, variable speed pumps with the frequency inverters. All right, we have already some feedback. We we'll just wait a couple more seconds more. It looks slightly different, so I will just present this to you. On the last one we had in Germany, it was like more the blue part, the dark blue part of the static pumps, and now it looks quite even today. <laughs> so it seems you're more innovative, let's yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's continue. All right, so. All right, so we'll start with the pump design. Um, we need to learn a few things or just remind you of a few things about pumps in general. Uh, we'll have a look at centrifugal pumps, which are the ones that we use in our um, units. And we'll have a look at their characteristics, their power consumption, what the power consumption depends on. And we will see how we work with pump curves and the most important things, how do we regulate the pumps in the sense of how do we um, find the operation point? Okay, so first of all... Um, Did you know I, that? Yeah, <laughs> pumps use 10 to 20% of the electrical energy worldwide. So there's a really huge number. It doesn't sound huge, but it's only pumps that consume 20%. So. Energy optimization of pumps saves an average approximately of 30% of the energy cost. So this is really much, so if you see this cake, so this is the general electric demand on worldwide. And then we see the red part, this is only pumps. So this is really, really much. And on the other side, we can see life cycle costs, LCC. And the investment cost here in red is typically 10 to 15%. The maintenance cost is the smallest part, it's 5 to 10% in yellow here. And then we have the energy cost, and it's approximately 80% of the life cycle cost. So this is where, where we can save the most money. <laughs> okay, if we look at centrifugal pumps, which are the most, probably the most common ones in the world and the ones we use also in our plants, um, the principle is pretty simple. So we have a rotating impeller, which accelerates the liquid that enters the pump. So basically we have a centrifugal force, like you see also here in this glass with water. Um, what happens then is that the water collides with the body of the pump and the velocity of the water is converted into pressure. You can see that here because the level of the water goes up on the sides of the glass. Um, characteristics of uh, centrifugal pumps are an even flow rate compared to, let's say, uh, volume pumps, which just have a pulsating flow. Um, it's possible to throttle the pump by uh, closing a valve located downstream of the pump. Um, we'll come to that in detail later. Um, during standstill, water can flow, can also flow back, um, because the impeller can be moved by the water if there is a pressure difference. And we have a lot of different centrifugal pump types uh, that cover a very large operation range. So we'll find everything from pumps with a, let's say, huge flow rate, low pressure, to high pressure, small to medium flow rate. Um, this is possible because there are lots of different types. Um, we have, for example, single stage uh, pumps versus multi-stage pumps. Um, multi-stage pumps have a number of impellers, which means uh, we can reach a higher pressure with our higher head with these pumps. Um, there are horizontal and vertical pumps. Um, they are differentiated by the orientation of the shaft. So in and one, these are the pumps you know from our plants. Um, there are also axial or inline pumps. Um, inline pumps have the same flow direction in the inflow and the outflow. That makes it easier um, to do the piping for the pump. And this is also the classical pump that you see in a reverse osmosis. All right, so 
how is it built? How is it arranged? So we see in this picture that we have always a motor. The motor represents the electrical part of the pump. In between the motor, we have the coupling where the power transmission happens. And on the bottom, we have the pump with the hydraulic part. So the pump itself is divided into a body itself, then into the impeller or impellers, depending on the type inside the pump and then the mechanical seal which is in between okay it's oh sorry i was too fast <laughs> no, I know. You. Um, so characteristics of pumps basically a pump is defined by the flow rate uh, that it can convey this is and the head um, the flow rate is the volume per unit of time. Usually that's given in cubic meters per hour for smaller pumps in liters per hour um, that the pump can convey. It's um, basically the mass flow rate divided by the density. In our case, it's not so important because we're always talking about water. So the density is usually the same. We don't need to consider that. But if you go for other liquids, that can be make quite a difference. Um, then we come to the head. That is the height up to which a pump can convey a liquid. Usually this size is given in meters. It also depends on the density of the fluid. In our case, it doesn't have much of an effect. Um, we can usually assume that a head of 10 meters corresponds to a pressure of one bar. Um, of course, if we would talk about very different temperatures or different fluids, that could change. Okay, next one. All right. So to have an idea about the pump consumption, we need to differ and a bit about the different um, indications on the identification plate of the pump. So we have a pH value, that's basically the power output of the pump, the hydraulic power on the lower part of the pump. Then we have the power output of the motor, the shaft power here. And then we have the power delivered from the electrical grid, which is basically here. So. The power output of the pump is calculated by the flow times the height times the density times the gravitational acceleration. <laughs> All right, so now we take this value and we divide it by the efficiency of the pump itself. And when we have the power output of the motor, we go up to this power and we divide the power output of the motor by the efficiency of the motor itself and then we have our actual power consumption and if we have the exception of a variable speed drive pump then we have a um, multiplying factor of the efficiency of the frequency inverter okay so now we have a question for you what do you think which of these parts uh, that we have described has the most, most losses? losses yeah so you can choose either frequency inverter, the motor itself, or the pump itself. Yeah, all right, looks good so far. So we wait a couple more seconds. All right, so we have different opinions <laughs> and now in the future slides, we will see what it is actually. Okay, so now if you have a look at the power consumption, you get a certain amount of power from the electrical grid. If you have a pump with a variable frequency drive or frequency inverter, um, you have some losses there. The losses are actually quite small. Um, usually the uh, variable frequency drive has an efficiency of more than 95%, so you have less than 5% losses. Um, if there are large motors, they can be even lower, maybe in the range of 3-2%. For small motors, the losses can be a bit higher than 5%, maybe up to 8 um, But on average, less than 5% loss. Then we come to the motor. Here we have uh, higher losses already. So usually a motor operates with an efficiency of 80 to 93 percent. Um, again, if we have a very large pump, usually it's a higher range. Um, 
And what is important, if the motor operates at less than the nominal load, so not at the intended operation point, but at the lower range, the efficiency can go down pretty fast. So then we can experience higher losses. So afterwards we go to the pump and here we have um, an efficiency of 70 to 80%. So this corresponds to the highest loss of all the components. Um, we have a loss of 20 to 30% usually. Um, and again, if we, let's say, need to throttle the pump to operate at a point, um, at a duty or operation point that is um, more on the left-hand side of the curve, we'll come to that, we can see a strong reduction in efficiency. All right, so let's have a look on the pump curves. So they are always two parts of the curves that we are using. We are using a pump curve here displayed in blue and we are using the system curve of our reverse osmosis system in red. So the pump curve describes the pump itself, not the motor, and they have always some tolerances for the flow, the height, the efficiency, and so on. And the pump curve equals the head flow curve. So here we see the flow displayed as Q and the height displayed as H. The system curve itself describes the ratio of the flow rate and the head in the system, and it depends on friction losses, static discharge of the head, and it's different for open or closed system. And the intersection point is our operation point, so this would be the orange point here. All right, so this is usually what people call the pump curve, the QH curve, but we have a few more curves really. This is the most important one. It's also called the performance curve sometimes. Then we have an efficiency or uh, called after the Greek symbol eta curve. Um, that is this one. And here you can see already uh, what we talked about in the previous slide. Um, we have a certain point where the efficiency is highest. And usually one tries to fix the operation point of the pump somewhere near the highest portion of the efficiency curve. So in this case, one could fix the operation point still a bit to the left, but then if you go more to the left, you already see that the efficiency deteriorates. And we have a maximum efficiency of say 70%. You can see that on the right-hand side. And then we would go down up to, four, let's say 40%, down to 40% really. Um, we have also another curve, um, the power curve. Well, usually in the US people say horsepower because they use horsepower more than kilowatts. Um, that's uh, the power consumption P2 we showed you before because this curve always describes the pump and not the motor. So in this case, so you see uh, the shaft power, what the pump gets from the motor. Um, the P1 power was actually taken from the electrical grid is still a bit higher, but is also given usually in the data from the pump supplier. We have the last curve, that's the NPSH curve or net positive suction head. This curve has to do with cavitation. We'll see that in the next slide. And basically, if we work with pump curves, we look at, uh, try to define the operation point. So we usually know our flow rate. We know the head that we need um, because of, let's say, membrane pressure in a reverse osmosis. We try to find a pump that fits the requirements so that we are on the performance curve. And then we read off the efficiency and we read off the power at our chosen operation point and we check the NPSH value. Um, this is the required one, and we check if we have um, the, this required value in our system. This is going to be the next slide. All right, so cavitation, so this is always a bit of a discussion, but some say it's the dry run of the pump, so we call it cavitation. So this occurs when the absolute pressure is lower than the wet power pressure of the liquid. So. When this happens, bubbles are formed and they implode when the pressure rises. And this cavitation reduces the flow rate and head and damage the impeller. So this is what you see on the right side. So it really damages the pump and it can't work probably anymore afterwards. And uh, read off the required NPSH value to avoid the cavitation and check that the actual NPSH is above the required NPSH. So this is basically why we always write we need a minimum pressure of two bar to operate the system. Okay, so 
we have talked about the operation point or the optimum point. In real life, of course, we are not always at the chosen operation point. An optimal range for the pump would be, uh, that's the smallest green square you see here, let's say 10% lower or 5% higher than the operation point. This is where you still have pretty much the same efficiency as at the operation point. A good um, range uh, is minus 20 to plus 10%. Here you drop a bit with the efficiency, um, but still it's fair enough. And a normal value that one usually sees in operation is minus 30 and uh, plus 15. Um, when we go out of this range, um, we start to experience problems. So um, if we operate the pump more on the left hand side, we see a wear out of the impeller. Um, we see at some point a shortened lifetime for the bearings and the seals as well. Um, and when we go pretty much on the left hand side or also on the right hand side, um, we see a higher risk of cavitation. So we have a start of cavitation on the left hand and on the right hand. Um, when we have a very, very slow, um, small flow through the pump, we can get overheating of the pump because normally some part you have seen all the losses. So that is basically at some point converted into heat, what we use as energy. And this heat has to be transported away with the water. And if you pump a very small amount of water, it can be that it's not enough to cool down the pump. Um, so we need to take care during the operation to stay in the, let's say, optimal or at least in a good range in order to avoid operation problems with the pump. All right, so now we have the question what to do with this information. <laughs> so basically, we need to decide, OK, how can we reach this optimal uh, operation range? So one function or one possibility would be to reduce the diameter of the impeller. And this one reduces the flow rate as well as the pump head. And it's a minor reduction of efficiency. So. Then we have the next thing, which is called the throttle valve. So this is what we mostly do in our system. So we install a reduction valve after the pump and just uh, destroy some energy after it. So this increases, uh, increases the pressure loss in the system and thereby reducing the flow. And the pump has to deliver a higher head than required by the system. So it's not that efficient. So with the variable frequency drive with the VFD, we have a flow rate that is proportional to the speed frequency, and it is the most efficient method for controlling the pump power. Okay, so now we look into a bit more detail um, at the three options. The first one, um, to change the impeller, to have an impeller with a slightly smaller diameter, um, that option is basically almost like putting a smaller pump in really so you have a reduction of the flow rate as well as a reduction of the head and a reduction of the flow rate by 20 percent results in a reduced energy energy consumption so we reduce that by 33 percent 33 is more than 20 that is because we always reduce at the same time the uh, the flow rate and the head as you see here on the left hand side um, this change has some advantages if we want to change our operation point with change of changing the impeller. Um, it is, let's say, relatively easy how, um, and it's only a minor reduction of efficiency. However, problematic is we need a shutdown to do this. So it's not a, a regulation that you can do or, um, during the operation of the pump and um, it's still a fixed operation point. Um, so it gives us a bit of flexibility, but really not much. It's an adjustment within narrow limits. And if you want to adjust the operation point um, more, we have to go to the next two options. All right, so the other one would be the throttle valve. So the throttle valve reduces the Q, so the flow, and increases our height. So we have a reduced flow, but an increased pressure. So the reduction of Q by 20% does not result in a significant change of energy consumption. Advantage of this is, of course, it's easy to adjust and the adjustment can be done during the operation. And a disadvantage is this is that the efficiency is really much lower. So as you can see, this would be our operation point. Our pump would operate here. So with the throttle valve, we reduce it to the flow, 
we need and we increase the pressure that the pump needs to produce. So markedly it's a higher energy consumption with throttling than with a smaller pump. Okay, the alternative to throttling the pump, of course, would be to use a variable frequency drive. Um, here we have a flow rate that is proportional to the speed frequency and we have a head that is proportional to the square of the frequency. That means if we reduce the flow rate by 20%, we also reduce the energy consumption by 35%. So this is uh, rather similar to what we have seen with changing the size of the impeller. And it's basically the same as if you would, or almost the same as if you put in a smaller pump. Because if you look at the graph on the left-hand side, you see that you don't just go up on the performance curve as with a throttle valve to a higher head, but you just change your performance curve completely. So when you go from NN to NX, it's a different performance curve. The advantages are it's a very efficient control method because you save a lot of energy. And there's only a minor reduction in efficiency when you change um, the frequency of the pump. Disadvantages, of course, um, there is some investment for the variable speed drive. Um, and there are some minor power losses because the variable speed drive, of course, has its own um, losses. However, uh, these losses are very, very small compared to um, the power saving potential you have with this pump when you operate somewhere outside the original design point. All right, so how does a variable, variable frequency drive pump look like? So it's just an inverter that sits on the pump. So basically it's exactly the same system. We have some sensors that give us feedback to regulate the pump and that's it. It's not much different. So the advantages of the control is we have to lower energy consumption, also lower life cycle cost, and we have a much more comfortable operation. So what does that mean? So as you know, in summer, the water is warmer. In winter, the water gets colder. So usually you are forced to regulate, to re-regulate the system so it operates at the correct flows. And with the VSD, you don't have this. So you can use the same pump in 50 or 60 Hertz electrical grid, so worldwide. <laughs> and the pumps within the ready VFD are easy to install also afterwards, not only in the start, and the components are very well matched. So we have another survey just to check if you listen to us, so which disadvantage does the regulation via a wolf have? So we have either higher energy consumption, higher invest, or that you need a shutdown. Oh, quick voting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> looks really good. You all <laughs> listen to us. <laughs> all right. So Absolutely correct. It was the higher energy consumption. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, next time, more difficult question. <laughs> I think we're making it too easy. Okay, um, so now from this, we'll go from the basics of talking about the pump into uh, the energy efficiency of the RO. So we have a look at the components very quickly and the life cycle cost of our RO unit. And we'll have a look at the key drivers for energy consumption. So what determines if our plant of our, our reverse osmosis has a high or low consumption and how can we make it more energy efficient? We look at adjustments during the design phase and also adjustments during the operation. So for the components, um, you all know these plants. Um, you can go in with a feed water on the left hand side. You pass the pre-filter, which is here stainless steel, but um, it's uh, blue plastic for the smaller plants. You go to the high pressure pump. In this case, it's one with a variable frequency drive, as you see here. If you had a pump without variable frequency drive, you would have a throttle valve here. So a ball valve that you can partially close. From there, you go to the uh, pressure vessels with the membranes. And finally, you exit the system via the permeate or the concentrate line. Now we'll go um, about we we'll go to the costs. So the life cycle cost of a plant, of course, you have a capital expenditure, the investment for the plant. 
that's usually what the client looks at, what everybody's focused on. But you have also the operation expenditure that you can describe uh, or can sort in two categories, let's say, the fixed operation expenditure that doesn't change um, with the flow rate or the time of use of the plant and the variable operation expenditure that is proportional to the cubic meters you process. Um, fixed operation expenditure is, uh, for example, maintenance and repairs. One could argue if, if it's completely fixed or not, because if you use the plant more, you will have more maintenance. But on the whole, let's say it's more or less fixed. Um, you have membrane replacement, um, same category, more or less. Um, you have the personnel for looking after the plant. So that's probably really a fixed cost and the analytic analytics that you have to do, let's say, every day. Then you have uh, the variable expenditure. Um, this is mainly chemicals, let's say, for example, anti-scale that you lose proportional to the feed flow. Um, that is the energy that you consume with the plant and the disposal of waste material, which would be in our case, the concentrate, for example. So um, when we look at this um, and we put some numbers on these um, different categories, we have a look and it's very interesting because the investment cost what we all talk about in the beginning now, which is the very important thing, um, is a relatively small amount of the total. This is uh, looking at the life cycle cost after 10 years. Usually the plant is used longer than 10 years, but we have chosen 10 years, it's a typical comparison. And you see the investment cost is relatively small. And the two costs that are really large are for one, one side, the water cost, and here, uh, what you see in green, the energy cost. So if we can um, think about how to minimize these costs, um, we have really saved a lot of money for the client. In our example, you see this is an uh, UODAS plant, so anti-scale. Um, we haven't looked at all the costs because chemical addition and so on is a relatively small part of the total. One could also add this, but the main blocks are there now. So you see the largest cost drivers. We have assumed an operation of 12 hours per day, 350 days per year, operation with well water in this case, because it's anti-scale, which has a relatively low water cost. If you use uh, drinking water, the water cost can be also considerably higher. And we have an energy cost of 0.15 euros per kilowatt, which is something normal for industrial consumers. If you go to more like more private consumers, it can be at least in Germany, a lot higher, more than 30 um, so cents per great. kilowatt hour. Um, what is interesting here is we have these two, two big blocks. Um, we are now talking about the energy. So what then can we do here? And you will see in the end um, on our last slide how far we can come down from the 70,000 euros. But there's also another topic, and this is just for you because we will do at some point another webinar as well. We have also high water costs. Here we can have a look at um, the efficiency of the reverse osmosis in the sense of how much per meter we produce from a given feed water amount. And this will be interesting because we will do a webinar at some point also about the KR series, which is um, a high yield system, which gives us 90% um, of permeate compared to 75%, which is the typical value. So that's another cost that we're gonna look at in another webinar. Okay, now we're gonna focus on um, the energy cost. And we have a look at what are the key drivers for our energy consumption. Okay, one, on one hand, uh, we have the main thing, the TDS in the feed water. So we have uh, a certain amount of salt. Um, this salt causes a certain transmembrane pressure. Um, and this pressure, in the end, determines our energy consumption. Another influence is the temperature of the feed water. If the temperature is higher, uh, we will also need a higher pressure. If it's lower, we need a lower pressure. And um, we have, um, I'm going to go first to the membrane type maybe. Okay. We have the membrane type. There are membranes who need more uh, pressure and therefore more energy and others who need less. Maybe some of you have been, have participated in our last webinar about nanofiltration. There you have seen also that we have a membrane, let's say a nanofiltration membrane, which can easily need 20% less pressure and therefore 20% less energy than, let's say, a reverse osmosis membrane. We have finally also um, the pressure of the water grid, which can contribute 
to uh, saving pressure and, uh, and therefore saving energy in our reverse osmosis if we can adjust the pump. We'll come to that. And we have the type of control. Um, so are we going to use a throttling valve or are we going to use a variable frequency drive? Okay, so these key drivers um, is what we have to think about. Now, if we want to adjust our design to have a very energy efficient plant, we have several options. So we can adjust our pump exactly to the pressure that we need according to the TDS in the feed water. That is done for customized plants typically. Um, if we have plants like the plants we sell, they're usually designed for a certain uh, totally soft solids level. For us, that's uh, 1000 milligrams per liter. And this is the level that will be enough for most of the drinking water um, sources that you see or well water sources that you see. But you could have also, let's say, a TDS that is only 500. Um, we can choose in the design an energy efficient membrane. Yeah, for example, nanofiltration instead of reverse osmosis or a low pressure reverse osmosis membrane. We can consider the feed pressure because we can say, okay, this is pressure that we already get from the water net and our pump is going to have to do only the remaining pressure to reach the pressure that is required according to design. And we can consider the temperature of the feed water. All this can be done. However, there are a few problems with these adjustments. So the feed water data is not always known, especially for small plants. Maybe we know, okay, it's drinking water, but that's already the extent of our knowledge <laughs> that can happen. Um, we have also, even if we know uh, the data exactly, we have a variation in feed water quality and temperature. Um, if we look at surface water, that's very obvious, no? Uh, if you take water from a river or a lake, you will have a huge variation in temperature and probably TDS between winter and summer. But even for, um, let's say, well water, you can experience that for drinking water too. If you have a storage tank on site and that storage tank is outside and only from that storage tank you feed the reverse osmosis, you can also have a large difference in temperature according to the season. The membrane type could be fixed by the salt rejection rate, let's say. So maybe we cannot choose the most energy efficient membrane that we would like to choose. And the feed pressure of the uh, water grid is also not always known or could be variable some, in some locations. In the end, um, what it boils down to is we always need a certain safety margin. So even if we want to choose the best operation point to minimize our um, pressure in the end and our power consumption, we will always need a safety margin because stuff happens in the end on site. Maybe the conditions are not what we wanted and we cannot be with our plant exactly at the operation point to save the most energy. So if we cannot do it usually by design, we can look at the adjustment of the operation. Right, so here we have these two options that we have talked about before. We have a throttle valve or we have a variable frequency drive. If we use a throttle valve, what we do is in the end, um, we put the plan into operation and we close the valve partially until we reach the desired flow rate. Usually we have to close it somewhat, let's say, I don't know, one third, half, whatever, because um, we have some sort of safety margin in our design, which means in the end we will start the operation and see, oh, we have a higher flow rate than what we anticipated. We have to close to throttle the pump and we'll increase the pressure to a value that we need to reach our flow rate, but that would not be required by the system. So we have a higher energy consumption than what we would need to have, right? If you use a variable frequency drive, we can adjust the frequency until the operation point is reached. The advantage here is that we basically choose the performance curve that fits our operation point in reality, and we can save energy and operate really with the pressure that is required by the plant, but not a higher pressure. Of course, we always have the discussion. Um, we have a different uh, investment cost, no? Because we have a certain additional cost for the variable frequency drive. And the big question is always, when does it make economic sense to use a pump with variable frequency drive? And that's what we want to show you in the next chapter. All right, so small questions. So what? when do you think is it going to be economical to sell the customer a VSD pump? Uh, yeah. 
All right, so we have three options, either starting from 100 liters per hour or B, 1,000 liters per hour or starting C with 3,800 liters per hour. All right, we already have some loadings that look good. Wow. We are still waiting a bit. All right, so you're absolutely right. That's funny. <laughs> we, had, we had the same questions the last days and the other ones weren't that good. So it's on point. <laughs> exactly. All right, now we will talk about the calculation of the energy consumption. We will just uh, talk a bit about basics and then we will have a look on three scenarios for the comparison. And we will compare the power consumption and also the energy costs. So if we want to compare the energy consumption, we are comparing the RON units with and without variable frequency drive. And, and we will talk about the power taken from the grid. And this one is compared. So we are using the series and the from 1650 to 30 cubic meters. And we are talking about the energy cost, or we are assuming the energy cost of 15 cents per kilowatt. And then we will talk about uh, operation time of 12 hours per day and 350 days per year. And the comparison is over a time span of 10 years. So the three scenarios will be TDS in the feed water is 500 milligram per liter instead of the design value with 1000 milligram per liter. Then we will talk about scenario two with a temperature instead of 20 degrees instead of our design value of 15 degrees Celsius. And then the third scenario with a uh, feed pressure of four bar instead of our design value with two bar. So here on this one, you see um, the pump with variable frequency drive and without variable frequency drive. So you see there's uh, quite a high deviation at some points and and on some points there's just a really really small one so in this scenario that's already scenario three with the operation with tds 1000 temperature 15 degrees celsius and only an increased feed water temperature and when we are using a vfd pump we are reducing p1 minimum to 26 percent at 3.1 cubic meter that would be around here and the maximum would be 55% energy reduction at 10 cubic meters. So this is this high gap here. On average, we can say it's like 36% of energy reduction. You may wonder maybe why it's so so different, let's say, right? <laughs> yeah. um, basically, it depends a bit on um, how much uh, reserve capacity the normal pump has, right? So if you have chosen for a, for a specific um, plant, a pump that is or where we have already put the operation point at really um, the maximum that the pump can do and it doesn't have any reserve capacity, we won't have so much um, reduction in the, in the power use with a variable frequency drive. But if we have like for the 10 cubic meter plant already a large pump that has quite a lot of reserve, so that is let's say generously sized, then you can really see that there's a big advantage in adjusting um, with a variable frequency drive, because otherwise you will use all the power of the pump and you wouldn't have to. All right, so let's just compare the uh, different scenarios a bit. So in scenario one, we reduce the total to solve solids to 500 milligrams per liter. And this would mean that we have a minimum reduction of the um, power needed of 17% and a maximum reduction would be 50%. So you see it's again in the same problems, let's say. Mm -hmm. On average, we have 29%. For the scenario two, we have the increased temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. We are having minimum of 23% and a maximum of 52. And you see it's already increasing to 34%. And if we are using scenario three with a operation of the increased feed pressure, we have already seen that it's 36%. So now we are going to the interesting parts. If we 
combine all those three scenarios, it will be much more. <laughs> exactly. So here we see what is our uh, additional invest for the pump. Then we have scenario one, two, and three. And then we have the amortization. So when we are achieving, let's say, point zero, where our unit prints money. So as you can see in red, this takes quite a long time for the smaller units, for 1,000 to 3,000 cubic meters. But starting from 3.8 cubic meters, we are already near to two years amortization. So as we move on to the bigger units, we see it's most likely in a half year, it's already amortized. So it's happening quite fast. So after 10 years, we can say the energy costs of 70,400 euros without the variable frequency drive versus 21,900 euros. So this is a really big gap, it's 50,000 euros. Exactly. And if you remember the, the graph that we have shown you in the beginning, we had exactly this cost because the example was with a 10 cubic meter plan. And we said, okay, about 70,000 euros in 10 years compared to 21, 20, let's say 22,000 with a variable frequency drive. And if you, have, if you have a look at the cost of the variable frequency drive, it's 2,000, less than 2,400 euros. And that's our list price, actually. Yeah. So, so that's what the price that is recommended that you give to the end client. Yeah, and you pay less. <laughs> exactly. And um, that's the really interesting part because very often we have the discussion only about, okay, yeah, it's an increased cost. Is it worth it? Do I really want to do that? But um, you can see that, number one, yeah, it is worth it. And it is worth it with variations that are relatively minor because you can easily go from 15 degrees Celsius to 20. Um, or let's say a PDS of 500 is also something that is quite common in real life. Um, and if you see this reduction here, we have combined the three um, scenarios. So we said, okay, TDS 500, temperature 20, and um, four bars water pressure. And that is really something that you will find is quite a common condition. Yeah. Of course, we cannot design our plants for the advantageous conditions because then we, you will have a lot of cases where there is not enough pressure. That's the point. But um, with a variable frequency drive, you can really adjust to the conditions on site. And I think it's a, it's a big advantage if one can show the client, look, yeah, you have an cost of 2,000, 3,000 euros, let's say, in the beginning, but you save a lot of money over 10 years. All right, so in summary, we can say the pump determines the energy consumption of the reverse osmosis system, and we can do adjustments by throttling or with the VFT pump, and considerable energy savings with VFT if operation point deviates from the sign point. So the modernization of the pump with VFT is already possible after six months. So depending on the size and everything. And we got the sources for this graphics and everything from the Grundfos book. And the handbook contains a lot of useful information. You can also download it from the Grundfos link. And of course, there's also an English version of it. Exactly. <laughs> we'll, send you the, we'll send you also the English link in the handout. Exactly. All right. So you will receive a certificate that you have participated in this webinar and also the handout with a the recording of the session and also the PDF slides. And moreover, you will receive a link to, yeah, that's what I just said. And if you have further questions, then don't hesitate to contact me or Birgit via phone or via email. Exactly. And if you have any questions, we can answer now. Feel free to ask. We are still here. We still have some time. Um, there was maybe one question in the in the last webinar in the German session. People were asking, "Hey, can you can we calculate this?" Um, we would like to give you a, a tool to calculate this. The problem is um, there are so many conditions, or this one ha would have to combine all the scenarios, and then you have to read off all the data points on the. Um, um, on the curve of the pump, actually, so it's not so easy just to calculate it. So it's a bit difficult, but um, we have we will include all the three scenarios, which look pretty similar. So we haven't shown them all, but we will include them all in the handout. 
and that already gives you the option to read off the consumption and then you can see already okay well the variable frequency drive is i don't know what 50 percent of the normal consumption and then you can think about if that is something useful for your client all right so if you have any more questions just feel free to ask us all right no more otherwise um we're going to be, uh, we will be very happy if you join us for the next webinar. So we're planning on a webinar on EDI in December. You'll receive the invitation as usually two uh, two weeks before. Yes. And um, yeah, we'll be happy to see you back. All right, then enjoy your day. And if you don't see us, have a nice weekend. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.